thank you all for joining today. I'm excited about today's guest. Uh, this is the Interim Expert Team's Tame the Change podcast. And what we do at IET is we help you embrace the chaos to empower your business. We have an esteemed guest today. Her name is Janice Amadeki. And I just want to read a quick intro from her because she's so incredibly impressive. Um, so she is the CEO and founder of the Mentor Method, an enterprise platform helping companies keep and develop their diverse talent using the proven power of mentorship. I love everything about that. So I'm going to kick it off with the first question and then we'll go through. So I'd love to add it. Have you had to make to accommodate the evolving situation? That's a great question. So because the mentor method is an enterprise SaaS platform, meaning companies can purchase a license and it's all available on your phone or your laptop or whatever device you choose to use. We haven't made a lot of changes simply because we have already been in the virtual space since 2017. However, we did have to add additional types of mentorship to our software to accommodate the adaptations that our customers were making. A lot of companies, once the sheltering in place order happened last year and COVID became um, very mainstream and something that everybody was aware of, they then had to shift from potentially always having a culture that empowered their employees to work in one space or have an actual office space to them pivoting to being completely remote. And so because of that, we knew that our customers would have a change of understanding and there would be some education in terms of how to adapt to this virtual workforce. And so we made sure that we were supporting them in that journey and in that transition through adding additional um, features to the Mentor Method software. Our focus has always been on making sure that our companies, that we're providing our companies the best possible virtual connections so that they can grow to something bigger and impact the way in which they see leadership. So we worked with select customers to ensure that our new offerings of group mentorship um, aligned with their actual expenses and their actual experiences with employee retention and engagement since everybody shifted to a virtual setting. So with that being said and how you know you guys started out virtually already, so that wasn't the biggest shift for you all. Um, right. What would you say you know, might be a global challenge that you feel like arised in the last um, nine months to a year that has affected the mentor method? In a positive way, this shift to building virtual connections in addition to seeing that their employees need more than just a stale manual mentorship program because you don't have the option to match employee number one to employee number two because they're both in the same cubicle location. They really have to get intentional about how they were matching their talent and get a better understanding of the why behind they were, the why behind creating these mentorship initiatives. So because of that, we saw our customers come back with more intentions of really fostering these meaningful interactions in addition to being able to um, in addition to being able to do so in a way that kept their team productive, efficient, while having a measurable impact. Obviously, George Floyd was infuriating. It was a moment that has changed all of our lives, the mentor method team and on a global level. And we would be remiss to say that we, as we showed our respects to George Floyd and as we wanted to play a part in the evolution of social justice in America, especially, we made sure that we were discussing diversity, equity, inclusion with all of our current and potential customers to ensure that they understood that creating a mentorship program with the Mentor Method software isn't just something that's nice to have, but it's critical, especially in these moments where your employees are scared. They're stuck in their apartments or homes for 24 hours a day, potentially. And now you have this added fear of what happens when they leave their homes, right? Is somebody going to hurt them, potentially kill them or a family member? It's a lot. And so we really wanted to make sure that the mentor methods technology and our focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion were playing a part in the bigger evolution so that Yes, we're at one tenth of a percent in the bigger picture, but we wanted to make sure that that one tenth of a percent 
was as impactful as humanly possible. Yeah. Love that. It's really important. Um, Christine, did you want to jump in with the next question? Um, sure. In your opinion, um, and I think we kind of covered this already with um, the situation that happened this summer with Black Lives Matter that was well overdue and now hopefully will continue to impact us in a positive fashion moving forward. Um, but overall, what challenges do you think that Austin is facing as a city, um, whether it's COVID related or, or social justice related, as well as globally? And you're already positioning yourself to provide a solution to those challenges, but are you considering any more now that these Absolutely. new things have arisen? Yes. So if we're just talking about Austin, there are generations of extreme hatred and racism, especially directed towards the treatment of the Black and Hispanic population in the city. And so I understand that as a whole, Austin is trying to correct those wrongs in the present, but there's a lot of trauma and healing that's going to have to happen um, from all parties involved, but especially the allies and those from majority groups, being able to understand the history behind the events that have taken place, the gentrification, all of the things that have impacted the Black and Latinx community, getting that deep understanding so that if they say toss out a solution that doesn't scale or doesn't take off the way they like, it's not just hanging that up and saying that they tried, but the majority is actually able to support the new majority of Black and Latinx leaders and you know future generations by taking the time to really understand why those solutions didn't work and then amplify their efforts by a factor of 10 or even 200, depending on what they were trying to do. Business-wise, overall, we're still seeing a disproportionate lack of funding and resources for companies run by Black and Brown founders, and especially um, women who are a part of the Black and Latinx community. Project Diane shared their annual funding report, and there has been a total of 90 Black women in the history of venture funding. Out of the billions of dollars that are available, 90 Black women have been able to secure at minimum a million dollars as compared to our straight white male counterparts. And 93 Latinx women have been able to accomplish the same thing ever. And so it's important that angel investors and smaller funds begin changing the culture of venture capital because they're really the future as these larger firms become less relevant and can sort of stick to their status quo and what has worked. So for example, Arlen Hamilton, um, with Backstage Capital, they invest in underrepresented founders. So that's women, people of color, LGBTQ+, and by investing in her fund and her initiatives, she's been able to deploy capital to founders like me, resilient Black founders who have a strong mission, have the traction, and are able to really amplify what leadership should look like and what entrepreneurship looks like, especially when you consider that Latin, Black and Latinx women are usually the majority buyer for CPG products, beauty products, and other markets where we are the dominant purchaser. I would also say on that note, in terms of what we're seeing, um, we're also seeing a lot of businesses that have turned their attention to where PPP funds and government issued funding did not. So in addition to a disproportionate amount of funding, we're also seeing a disproportionate amount of these um, small business loans being allocated to where the greatest need is not, let's say. So for example, you might have Tom Brady's business getting millions of dollars in funding or Joel Osteen, who also received millions of funding, they don't need it. The businesses that really need it are the mom and pop pizza shop that's been an institutional foundation to say the city of Austin that has had to close their doors because they weren't recognized as needing the funding, which is insane to me. So being able to shift that, I mean, we can't change the government overnight as we've seen, but you know, buying from these local businesses, mm -hmm. buying from creative, supporting the nonprofits that are deploying capital to these organizations. So 
whether that's supporting the Austin Justice Coalition and their fight for social justice, which is so important, and donating and dedicating time in addition to funding, or even organizations such as Boss Babes ATX, which developed their own grant in the middle of a pandemic to support their community of creatives. That's how we can start seeing this change so that these challenges that I'm discussing and these negative trends that we're seeing don't become the norm for the next 10 years. Because right now we're at that pivotal point where we decide, is this something that we want to change immediately? Or are we going to let this linger the way we initially let systemic racism and bias linger? And now it's become a cross-generational issue. So I really hope that you know those that are listening to this and watching um, and those that feel as passionately as I do about equity on all fronts are able to deploy capital, time, and resources to ensure that we go in the direction of equity for all versus adding another layer that will bring down Black, Latinx, and other represented, other underrepresented communities. Absolutely right. This is definitely an inflection point on every level. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's so much to unpack there. I feel like that I wanted to chime in so many times because there's so much good stuff happening. Yeah, um, you, you asked me a great question. I was kind of on a roll. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, so kind of to, to go backwards a little bit, like um, what you were talking about with the the CPG markets and kind of how black and brown women kind of are, are the main consumers. There's also a, a lot of numbers around how um, having a more inclusive culture at work and um, and how like, Black and brown leaders and leaders of all kind of uh, diverse backgrounds are actually are more motivated and more successful in the long run. And they help um, add to kind of like the bottom line of your business. So there's really so many reasons for people to be um, kind of making and committing to this change besides just being a person, right? Like being right. a person who cares and gives a shit. Um, but so how, how do you see, especially with something like the, the, the mentor method and with mentorship in general, how do you see, um, like, what's the best way for people to be an ally and really nurture that and kind of give the resources that are needed and give the voice where it's needed and kind of step back? Absolutely. I think in terms of corporate mentorship, that has to start from the top. So when you're building your budget as a CEO or head of finance, Whoever has the greatest connection to PNL should be deploying some level of budget so that heads of human resources, chief diversity officers, leaders of employee resource groups are empowered and equipped to purchase tech solutions like the mentor method, to be able to purchase things that are beyond just the standard issue DEI training. However, oftentimes what we're seeing are these individuals who have the monumental responsibility of shifting an entire company culture are also given the least amount of budget allocation to do so. And so until leaders recognize that there is a direct relationship between how you invest in your employees, whether that's through mentorship, leadership development, training and other resources, the way in which you show that you care about your employees is to give them top tier, high value experiences that empower them to become the best possible versions of themselves. And so that can't happen if you're giving, if you're a billion dollar company and you're giving your head of diversity, equity and inclusion $100,000 a year to work with, that's a conference. And a conference can only do but so much. Whereas let's say mentorship can be a lifelong and life changing relationship that increases skills confidence, increases your aperture to see what's possible, and also helps um, employees feel a higher level of loyalty and dedication to the source of that next level mentorship. I love that. That's a great answer and really helpful, honestly. Um, Do you feel like um, that there's a certain type of business or a certain kind of person um, or I guess a certain kind of organization that's more receptive to a program like the mentorship method, um, as opposed to maybe one that would, would give some pushback or not see the need um, or the, like, the benefit of it. Yeah, I don't think it's an industry specific thing. I think it's more on the eyes of and the experiences of leadership. 
So if you're at a company where your CEO, the C-suite, all the way to directors do not understand that relationship between diversity, equity, inclusion, employee retention and engagement to the business's bottom line, then they're really not a fit for the mentor method. Obviously we'd love to help them, but that's what we've seen. Those that say, we don't have a diversity and inclusion problem. We have you know, one black woman on our leadership team out of 50 people. There's a level of education that needs to happen at a very core human functional level that needs to happen before they truly understand. Fortunately, oftentimes when people engage with say a top tier employee engagement solution, whether that's the mentor method or otherwise, they're, once they see that relationship, the amount of money that they're saving, um, the amount of dedication that their employees have from a productivity perspective, seeing a future at the company, then they start to get it. So sometimes when you don't have those fundamentals of a CEO who truly believes in investing in their people, if you're able to hit the bottom line and hit their revenue and expenses, then they start getting bought in and it becomes a slow learning process. We'd love for it to be faster, but at least it's something to start. Yeah. If we have time for just at least one more, I had a follow-up as well, but just looking at how amazing the program is, Janice, I wanted to ask you kind of what the catalyst was for it. What was that yeah. moment? in time where you're like, this is what I'm going to do. This is the answer because this was the, the issue that came up. I'd really love to know kind of that moment that, that you decided this is what you wanted to do and what, what happened to inspire you to do that. Absolutely. So I was inspired once and then inspired again, if that makes sense. So the first time um, I was taking a class through Harvard, um, I was pursuing a strategic management certification. And so I was in a disrupting technologies class. Final project, we had to look at an industry and determine how we would innovate upon it. And so immediately I thought of mentorship. I didn't know where it came from. And I said, like, that was very random. Like, why did I think of that so quickly? But there was something sticky about the solution that um, my team and I brought to the table. Upon reflecting the why behind that, I'm first generation American. My parents immigrated from the Congo and so early on, we didn't have a lot of money. And it was through workforce development programs where my dad was connected to mentors who taught him about technology and other career opportunities that we went from, you know, six people in a two bedroom apartment and not the best neighborhood in the DC metro area to a five bedroom home with a yard in a good school district. So for me as a byproduct of tech and mentorship, I understand that when you advocate for that one person who doesn't even know that they should be advocated for, it increases their confidence, their family members see this change. So then they now know what the new benchmark is, you know, for success career-wise, life-wise, et cetera. Their communities then see it. They're able to contribute to the economy, like building businesses like myself or contributing to their corporations. And then they're also able to then give back to their communities, whether that's time, resources, the things that they've learned, it all comes together and it's this tidal wave that's all interwoven. Um, in addition to that, my mother was my best friend, my biggest supporter in building the mentor method. And um, she ended up passing away August, 2018 from pancreatic cancer. And one of our last conversations when she was in hospice was that she was really proud of the work I was doing with the mentor method. She was proud to see, you know, her baby building a business, going against the odds to do this because when she immigrated and went to Indiana State, she wished that she had mentors like the people I'm connecting underrepresented professionals to. She wished that she had a system since she didn't know anybody. She wished that there was something like the mentor method that could have helped her meet the right people to help her evolve in her career. And so having that heart to heart conversation as the second to last conversation I ever had with her really lights that fire in me to keep going and keep building this and continue doing this for the Lorenas of the world, if you will, that's my mom's name, 
um, the people who need it and the people who want it, but maybe don't know the best place to find that mentorship, being able to make it easier for them to get what they need to continue evolving in their careers and feel happy at the end of the day or their life and where they went means everything to me. For sure. And thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I just want to say how (laughs) critical the work you're doing is and that, you know, I'm just so grateful that you not only started, but you're continuing it with your team. I think we had a follow-up. Yeah, uh, just real quick. um, It's, I, I, uh, I really agree with kind of what you're saying across the board. And um, I think an important takeaway from this is a a conversation we're having with a lot of people where it's people keep talking about wanting to go back to the way things were um, to return to normal. And that's absolutely not what we need, right? Like this has been a wake up call and it's so important to start embracing things like the mentor method. Um, So uh, what do you feel like besides mentorship Um, are a couple of quick bullet point takeaways that our audience can use for kind of taming that change and starting to make a difference as we move forward. Don't get complacent. Just because you think you did one impactful action, you've got to follow up. One week of posting quotes from influencers on your Instagram stories does not an ally make right? You have got to do more than that. Put your money where your mouth is. Support the nonprofits that are doing the real work. Um, Dedicate your time to mentor other businesses if they need it. Help your team and create space where your team can have constructive and maybe difficult conversations about the world around them. Don't try to build this microcosm where everything is normal and perfect because it's not and that's uncomfortable, especially for those that are directly impacted like the black community, um, given the social justice concerns that are taking place right now. Don't turn a blind eye. If you see an ally or somebody in your network acting in a way that supports white supremacy, hatred, bias, don't just shrug your shoulders and say, oh, okay, well, you know, they're from the generation where that was acceptable, or we're in Texas, as in we're in the South. So there's always going to be a little of that. I do not accept that as an excuse. It is, that's exactly what it is, an excuse. So hold other people accountable. When you think you've done enough, try doing just 5% more and include your friends and include those with influence and maybe a shared passion so that the workload does not fall on those of the black and impacted community. This is something that, you know, as we've seen with Stacey Abrams, she literally changed the entire future of America, but it should not have taken her losing an election and being a victim to systemic bias and racism and having that election stolen from her for people to recognize what an impactful, beautiful, intelligent human being and a blessing to America and the world that she's always been, right? So remember that there are other people equally as passionate, equally as talented that you should be getting behind, not because it's going to give you likes on social media, but because it really is the right thing to do. That was said very, very beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, for sure. Beautifully said. Well, we so appreciate your time today, Janice. And again, just incredibly grateful for your thought leadership and for what you're doing, uh, not only for the local community, but globally and how this is going to positively impact people. So uh, in closing, we are the interim expert team. This is the Tame the Change podcast and we will see you in the next episode. Awesome. Thanks so much, Janice. We appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for your time. Thank you again. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.